In case you missed it, I recently became an FRC mobility specialist. I learned so much during the certification and have so many things I'm really excited to bring to my clients, but I realized really quickly, I need to practice what I preach. In today's video, I'll do a head to toe mobility assessment on myself. And after I assess the mobility of each joint, I'll prescribe a few drills to include in my movement routine. Before we do that, let's quickly discuss what mobility actually is. So I've talked about mobility a lot in the past, but today I just wanna give you a very simple definition. Mobility is simply strength and control in your range of motion of a joint. So while you might be super flexible, you might not have strength. And mobility is really important because it's going to define how your body ages. If you want your joints to feel good at 70, you need to earn it. Now online, mobility is often shown as dynamic movement rather than static movement. And that's not quite wrong, but it's also not quite true. And I'm sure that I have made that oversimplification at some point in the past too. But today I'm hoping to expand your understanding of what mobility is just a little bit more. So let's do it. All right, I filmed these mobility drills with myself like a month or two ago. So let's see how I did. What we're actually gonna be looking at are cars or controlled articular rotations. This is essentially a controlled joint circle. This can be used in two ways. It can be used as an assessment tool to assess the mobility of a joint and it can be used as daily practice. Cars will not fix your mobility issues. You can get better at performing the skill of a car, but it will not increase your range of motion or it will not improve your mobility. It is simply going to preserve the mobility that you already have. And remember, with that mobility that you already have, if you don't use it, you will lose it. So let's go through a look at my cars assessment and then we'll go through and actually prescribe some drills that will improve and increase my mobility. All right, so this is a neck car. I don't see anything crazy concerning there. I will say that I have been practicing my neck cars more and I have gotten better at that, like tipping the ear back portion of it, but I don't experience any pinching, any pain. I think I have pretty good like cervical isolation. So the neck passes the test. Let's keep on going. All right, so now we're going into the scapula. So these are your shoulder blades. We wanna be able to move these in protraction, retraction, elevation, and depression. So front, back, up, down. And we're looking to make sure that I'm not compensating anywhere. So I'm gonna look at the hands here. If they're sliding like front and back over the thigh, then that's gonna tell me that I am compensating a little. That looks pretty good. One of the big things I've noticed with a lot of my clients is that they have issues protracting. So that position where the shoulders are forward and creating space in that upper back. That's gonna be really important because your scapula or your shoulder blades need to glide around your rib cage for a lot of different things. A really simple example is like a push up. I don't see any real compensations there. I've never had any issues with my shoulder blades. So we're gonna give it thumbs up. Let's go to the shoulders, see how we do here. So we're going abduction across the body. I wish I had the other side of this one. <laughs> because this is also my injured shoulder. Slight limitation in extension, which is pretty common, but I'm not twisting at all. So a lot of times what you'll see is people reach back, they start to twist their whole torso. Okay, we're going to the other arm now. So another thing you'll see very commonly is as we come up bicep by the ear, flared rib cage, arched low back. None of that. Yeah, I would just say like a little extension or that reach behind, especially on the way down. Yeah, not terrible range of motion by any means. I think knowing my shoulder issues from when I did injure it. The two things that I lack are strength in internal rotation and actually my rotator cuff, like strength, so I guess external rotation and then abduction. So really what that tells me is that my range of motion is fine. Now it's time to add strength in that range of motion. All right, let's move it on. What are we doing now? Oh, the hips. I already know I'm gonna fail this. This is my right hip. This one is stronger than my left. My left one's actually having some issues. So what I'm looking for is movement anywhere else. We're getting a little low back involvement here. And then as I come into internal rotation, I have to fight because instead of just internally rotating my femur, I'm twisting my whole pelvis. So internal rotation is an issue. Yeah, we're getting a little compensation through the low back and extension. Yeah, yeah, girl. Yeah, and this hip actually is a little pinchy. Failed. 
All right, so what am I seeing? Keep in mind, I know a lot of these things about myself already too from physical therapy. I would say the big thing that I need to work on is internal rotation. I have maybe five, 10 degrees and lacking that range of motion isn't an issue until it's an issue, right? I've actually decided to cut squatting out of my personal programming for a bit until I can get more internal rotation because I'm starting to get some knee pain and I'm assuming it's from that. It might also be from my ankle, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So essentially once you hit 90, in a squat, your hips have to internally rotate. But if they literally can't because there is not any space there, you're gonna start to pull from somewhere else. So for me, it's my knee. So I need to build more internal rotation. And I actually saw a lot of compensations in hip extension, really going into that lumbar spine. So those are the two things we're gonna implement. All right, let's come back up. We're kind of going out of order simply because of my camera angles. So let's look at the elbows. This is something that people would never think about. So at the elbow, it is really important that you can supinate and pronate because a lot of different drills call for that position. Let's say for example, you don't have full pronation at the elbow joint, but you wanna work on pull-ups. Well, an overhand position isn't gonna be the best option for you. I would either recommend working on a neutral grip or if you have full supination, you can also work on a chin-up. So that's just one example. Let's see how my elbows do. So I'm looking at the hands. Am I comp compensating from the wrist at all? Yeah, you can see my right arm, look at that twist. I can't get that full pronation on that right side. Supination looks okay. Yeah, yeah, failed. I shouldn't be doing pull-ups. <laughs> Yeah, so pronation on that right side, gotta work on that. We can implement some drills. All right, so now let's go down into the wrist. Yeah, so wrists, a lot of people complain about wrist pain, wrist issues, but it's very rarely shown how to fix it besides just like passively stretching them or avoiding them all together. Let's say that you have a goal to do push-ups. Well, if you don't have full, I'm not doing this in the right position, <laughs> wrist extension, why am I gonna load your entire body on your wrist if you don't have that passively? Because again, now we're gonna have to pull from elbow, shoulder, somewhere else to get into that position. So let's see how my wrists do. So we're doing a car here, which means we're doing that controlled articular rotation. I'll show you from the front too. Wrists are really annoying because it's like not a normal joint. It's just like a lot of bones hitting each other. Flexion extension, good. You don't see any compensations like through the fingers. Yes, yeah, so see how my fingers start to move there? There we go. So if my fingers were to curl in at the top, we would know that I'm kind of cheating at the wrist. Let's go to the other angle. So with your wrist, you wanna make sure we're not compensating as we come in or out, like from the shoulder, from the elbow. Imagine you have like a pencil on top of your wrist. Oh, so see, I just would have lost that pencil. It would have dumped in. And it's hard and tricky. And honestly, like cars are a skill. The only way to get better at them is to do them. Um, but overall, my wrists are good. I would just say like, keep doing your cars. Let's go down. We're gonna look at, so what I'm doing here is just checking my patella or my kneecap. You wanna go for a straight leg, but not locked out. And you just wanna make sure that your patella can glide a little bit. So I like to go up, down, side to side, make some circles. And as long as you have a little movement there, you're good. So we pass that test. Okay, now we're gonna look at the knee. So a lot of times when we think of the knee, we think of just bending and extending. But the knee is two joints like this. And we need to have a little bit of movement between those two joints. Because if we look daily life, athletics, we're not always bending and extending completely forward. We're moving, we're shifting. So we wanna make sure that A, we have a little bit of that movement and B, we have strength in that little bit of movement. So these are tibia rotations. I'm actually, yeah, I don't think I'm, I don't think I do knee cars in this. And so the thing you're looking for is making sure that you're not using the ankle to get it done. Like, are you truly rotating from below that knee? As this I think is one of the first times I did it, so I'm trying to figure it out. I actually would take my heel off the ground now to do it. Shocking to no one, more external rotation than internal. I would say with these, yeah, internal, I start to compensate from the hip a little bit. I think I just need to practice these and see if I can get better at them. Yeah, I would actually sit back and like let my arms take the weight of my leg. More internal on this side. Yeah, I would say just practice is gonna be key for these. Cause again, it's a skill. So I would take a month and just implement these into your routine pretty much daily. It takes barely a minute and then reassess from there. All right, we're getting into the ankles. Let me tell you all about my left ankle. I've mentioned this in passing once before and I'm like, oh, this is actually like, this is probably make a really interesting video. When I was in high school, I had a melanoma on my ankle and there was like a tumor underneath. And just because of where 
it sat like with like my lymphatic flow. They also took out some lymph nodes in my groin. Benign, thank goodness. So really all I had to do was have the surgery and then like no radiation, no chemo, like very, very lucky. Unfortunately, the incision healed really poorly and I had to like relearn how to walk. Again, story for another day. But since then, I have just had a lot of issues that stem from my ankle. <laughs> Literally every time I go to my physical therapist, he's like, I think it goes back to your ankle. And I'm like, okay, well, great. So I already know going in, like I don't have a lot of great dorsiflexion on that side. It also goes down into my big toe mobility. It's, it's not great. We're gonna work on it though. All right, so we're doing a car here. Right side looks good. Let's look at the left. I will say I, I've been working on my dorsiflexion and it's gotten better. It actually doesn't look bad in this. I think for me, I just know my, I know my feet and I know my ankles and I need more strength in that range of motion. The other thing with ankles is if you like, if you feel like you've been working on your dorsiflexion or like the bottom of a squat, but if you feel like you've been working on it for a long time and it's not getting better, you actually might need to focus on your inversion and eversion because to point and flex or plantar flex and dorsiflex, your foot is gonna have to come in and out a little bit too. So if you don't have those ranges of motion, you're only gonna be able to point and flex so far. So for my ankles, I have a specific like resisted dorsiflexion drill for my left foot because part of what happens with my left foot is that my my bones are out of place. So I'm gonna continue with that drill. And then I wanna implement some inversion eversion and kind of experiment and see what that does. All right, do we do the feet? Did I not wanna put free foot pics on the internet? Wow, I don't think I did the feet. I didn't. All right, maybe we'll make that a different video because I am not filming any more footage. Maybe I was like, I don't wanna put my bare ass feet on the internet which is fair. All right, let's look at what we're doing. There's so much stuff here. This is though, this is common. Like if you opened any one of my client programs at the very bottom, I have notes on their mobility and it looks like this. Like everyone's a little broken and that's very normal. We're not robots. We're not gonna function exactly right all of the time. It comes down to how you approach it and how you deal with it. I did add just like a reminder at the bottom for me because I'm kind of building out my mobility routine and things I wanna implement, you know, a few times a week, picking and choosing adding them in the, here and there. And one of the drills that a fellow coach gave me like two years ago that I implemented, it was really helping with my core strength and my low back. And then I just stopped doing it. It's like this supine band resisted, almost like a stomach vacuum, but not the ones where you see people doing it and be like, this helped me lose so much weight. Not like that. I just have a tendency to like race from my upper abdominal region and don't get a lot of contraction of my lower fibers basically. And this drill was really helping me and I stopped doing it. So I when I add it back in. So this is my reminder. It has nothing to do with mobility. <laughs> so you're gonna see more of what I actually prescribe here in the next follow-up video. I'm gonna take this information, prescribe specific drills, and then show you my results. If you wanna work on your mobility but don't know where to start, I do have a four-week move and mobility program. It is perfect for people who wanna keep up their strength training while also implementing some really basic mobility drills into their strength programming as well as on their recovery days. So I will leave a link to that down below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out and I will see you all in the next one.